Okay, thank you, Tosia. Good uh, afternoon to everyone and welcome. Uh, my name is Rafael Mlauzi. As uh, Tosia has said, I'm a registrar in the division of Otorano and Boruti in the city of Cape Town in South Africa. Welcome to our consultants and fellow registrars from South Africa and across the continent. Today, we are discussing a, a case, of, case of advanced laryngeal cancer, which is a T3, T4. Uh, so I'm having a problem going down the screen here. Okay, so I've not, sorry about that, I've not disclosures to make and uh, my work is referenced to, to PubMed and I use these uh, test books for my presentation, Scott Brown's Cummings, Grace, and I also used uh, the UCT's Open Access Atlas of Otolaryngology and Neck Operative Surgery. And I also used the African Head and Neck Society website for guidelines. So advanced cancer of the larynx is uh, the second most uh, common malignancy of the upper aero digestive tract. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma accounts for 85 to 95% of uh, laryngeal malignancies. There are about 156,000 new cases globally and 83,000 deaths. Males predominate with a 3.8 ratio to females. It is most common after the age of 60 and less so in age less than 40. Uh, the common, the, the common causes are tobacco and alcohol, and they both have a synergistic effect on each other. And fruits and vegetables have been found to be protective, but there's an unclear association with the gastroesophageal reflux and the HPV. So the larynx is divided by anatomical sites into three portions, the supraglottis, the glottis, and the subglottis uh, by those lines. The blood supply is from the superior and inferior laryngeal arteries and also contribution from the cricothyroid artery. The venous drainage is, from, is by the superior and inferior laryngeal veins. The nerve supply is from the vagus nerve, mainly this through the superior laryngeal nerve, which has an internal sensory branch and external motor branch and the current laryngeal nerve. And also we get some sympathetic nerves. Lymphatic drainage above the vocal cords drains into the upper tip cervical nodes and below the vocal cords into all those nodes, including the lower tip cervical nodes. Scoma cell, uh, supraglottic, uh, squamous cell carcinoma is a propensity, uh, propensity to spread late and it affects a uh, 50%. Uh, it's usually spreads 50% of it spreads to the, uh, to the glottis. The epiglottic uh, foramen, uh, foramen make uh, for easier spread and hyoid invasion is rare. And spread to cervical lymph nodes is 23.8% for T3 and about 34% for T4 cancers and it normally spreads to levels two, three, four. They are the ones which are mostly affected. And the glottis lymphatic spread is less common than the other sites due to less uh, lymphatic uh, uh, tissue there on the cords. It normally spreads to levels two, three, four, and six. And the spread to cervical lymph nodes is about 14% for T3 and 32% uh, for T4. Subglottic squamous cell carcinoma is quite rare and it tends to extend caudally and circumferentially. And level six is usually affected. It is a propensity for bilateral and contralateral metastasis. The incidence is, uh, of cervical metastasis is based on case series because this is quite a rare cancer. You will not get, there is no like a, a series with a, a large numbers involved. There's the entity of a transglottic cancer, which is a, defined as a tumor that crosses the ventricle in a vertical direction. It has aggressive behavior and there's a high risk of lymphatic metastasis and it is not defined in the HACC uh, staging system. The largest series I could find for this uh, entity was by Kishner, which was done about more than 40 years ago, which had 50 cases. And from those uh, cases, there was a 30% uh, uh, cervical metastasis. So in terms of staging the, of the cancers, we also, as we have seen, we've divided into supraglottis, glottis, and subglottis. So we're dealing with advanced uh, cancer of the larynx, which is T3 and T4. So T3 is a tumor which is limited to larynx, and what is common to all these is that there will be vocal cord fixation, and we to invert any of the above areas for the supraglottis 
and uh, then there's T4, which is moderately advanced, which is, will be T4A, and then there'll be T4B, which is a, a very advanced. So that's the uh, staging for the glottis, and that's the stages for the uh, subglottis. As I've said, uh, T4B, this is very advanced local disease. It's common to all the anatomical sites. It is a tumor that invades the prevertebral space and encases the carotid artery and invades mediastinal structures. And then there's the N and M category, a nodal a spread of the, of the tumor from NX to N3A and 3B, with a 3B being any node to clinically overt a external extension. M category, we know that one. And then I want to come to stages. What I want to draw attention to is stage three. Stage three is different from T3 as we are well aware, which is we define advanced cancer. Because stage three, if we look according to the AJCC, this is the latest classification system. It actually, it actually includes T1 and T2 tumors, which happen to have vocal, mobile vocal cords. And the treatment for that is different from advanced uh, cancer of the larynx. This is, this is of great significance, as we shall see later when I discuss the treatment. Presentation is with local symptoms or systemic symptoms. Systi systemic symptoms are rare, but they include weight loss, anemia, and paraneoplastic phenomena. Presentation of this in the supraglottis, you get uh, all the symptoms, dysphonia, dysphagia. And in terms of the glottis, you get a dysphonia, normally a hoarse voice. And in the subglottis, these tend to present with an um, advanced disease with a dyspnea and stridor, mainly airway obstruction. The diagnosis of uh, a cancer of the larynx uh, depends on a complete history and uh, physical examination of the head and neck, especially. And uh, we have to do a flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy at the clinic, which we, we can do at office setup just to have a look at the larynx and determine the tumor extent. And then the definitive uh, diagnosis is, for, is by biopsy and panendoscopy. This is uh, in main theater. They were looking for synchronous tumors and to look at the extent of the tumor. Imaging, we do chest x-ray for all these cases to check for metastasis and to exclude uh, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. In our institute, we rarely do, uh, we don't do, routinely do CT scans and MRIs for these tumors, but if you are to do the CT scan and MRI, this is the information that you will get. You will be looking for invasion of the pre space, invasion of the paraglottic space, the thyroid or cricoid invasion, pre space invasion, invasion of the mediastinal structures and encasement of the carotid artery. So there are three aims of treatment. The first one is just to cure the patient. The second one is to prevent larynx to preserve larynx function. And the third one is to minimize morbidity because of the treatment. Most of these are treated by a combined uh, modality and the total laryngectomy is the bona fide treatment. Organ preservation uh, uh, for, is for, to make sure that afterwards the larynx is functioning. In determining the standard of care for these cancers is difficult due to the many treatment variables available. Prognostic factors before treatment, these are the things one has to consider before they embark on the treatment. You have to look at patient factors, tumor factors, and, and institutional factors. On the patient factors, you look at all those age, comorbidities, uh, compliance and reliability, performance status, and for us here in Africa, distance uh, from the treatment center. How often will you see the patient after you have uh, initiated your treatment? Also, tumor factors, we look at the histological diagnosis, site of primary tumor, and all those TNM state resection margins. And in terms of the institute, it depends on what you have. You look at the expertise and the equipment that you have. You look at a, a surgical expertise. Do you have a speech and language therapist? Do you have a oncological expertise? This table is taken straight from a, our recommended a, edition of Scott Brown. So it lists the advanced cancer of the larynx T3 and T4A. They excluded T4B. And then it guides us to the first, second, and third choice of treatment that is available. As you can see, for T3, they advocate for first choice, which is a, a chemo radiation therapy, first choice. And then second choice is those ones which are listed there and the third choice. So what I'll do is I'll go through this in textbook style, style and just describe them. And then at the end, I will look at what the literature says, what should we be doing? Because as we shall see, the treatment of these tumors is not so straightforward. 
when it comes to chemo radiation therapy, you can only offer that to a patient. It's, it has to be stringent. Your criteria has to be quite stringent. It has to be a patient with a good performance status with a minimal or no comorbidity. Disease has to be limited to the larynx and there shouldn't be any cartilage invasion and they should have a, a functioning larynx and should not have any, they should not, shouldn't be having any airway compromise and imaging should be available. Salvage surgery, make sure that if you're offering them a chemo radiation therapy, then salvage surgery it can be performed at your institute. And you can also offer it to a patient, for example, who refuses a, a surgical intervention. Transoral laser microsurgery, this is minimally invasive surgical approach. And the aim here is to have a functional organ preservation at the end, in other words, a functioning larynx. This employs endoscopic instruments, microscopes, and lasers, and it uh, involves piecemeal tumor uh, resection with the uh, tumor-free margins and normal tissue preservation. And the wound bed is left to heal by secondary intention. Uh, most laser therapies use carbon dioxide, and that is the workhorse in laser surgery. And there's less morbidity. The advantage of it is that there's less morbidity than open uh, surgical approaches. Uh, in the study, 20, 226 patients with a uh, pathological T3 tumors were treated with transoral laser microsurgery. Um, about half, it was half, half, most of, half was with glottic squamous cell carcinoma and half with supraglottic. And they were treated with a, a transoral laser microsurgery, neck dissection, and post-op radiotherapy. And the results were comparable to partial and total laryngectomy, but it was superior to primary chemoradiation therapy. And there was a low morbidity, rapid recovery, and good function after the, after the treatment. So the third one is open partial laryngectomy. This is organ preserving uh, surgery. It can be offered in selected cases and is better oncologic and uh, functional outcomes than primary chemo therapy again. It is similar, it is similar oncological to, to transoral laser microsurgery. These are actually different procedures which are categorized by the anatomical uh, focus, whether in the glottis or supraglottis, in surgical orientation and extent like uh, vertical and, uh, and horizontal. So this is where you get uh, uh, entities like a partial vertical laryngectomy, supraglottic laryngectomy, supracricoid uh, operations. Transoral robotic surgery, this is, a new, uh, this is a, a new procedure which was approved by the FDA in 2009. It uses remote controlled miniaturized surgical instruments with magnified visualization using a high definition 3D camera. It's been explored for supraglottic, mostly supraglottic, but also glottic and uh, even total laryngectomy. It's used in few selected T3 laryngeal cancers and T4A supraglottic uh, cancers. The main issue here is adequate exposure. In experience, yes, the pre glottic space and the base of tongue are not contraindications. And the use of, of uh, robotic surgery in total laryngectomy is still evolving. And there are few case uh, reports and the indications. Total laryngectomy, this offers the best chance uh, for local regional control. It's a bona fide treatment uh, for T3 laryngeal cancer, especially in patients with laryngopharyngeal dysfunction and fist vocal cords. So before we do a total laryngectomy, these are the things we have to think about. Tumor resection lines. As well, when you're doing a total laryngectomy, you're actually entering the tumor from outside. You don't see it from inside. So you have to think about what resection lines are going to have Important is thyroid gland management because we know that 25% of total laryngectomy patients will develop hypothyroidism after hemithyroidectomy. And if we add radiotherapy, adjunct radiotherapy after that, we are looking at a 75%. So the thyroid gland should be managed in uh, patients with subglottic primary lesions, which tend to extend to uh, level six, lesions with significant subglottic extension and transglottic lesions. Will the patient need a pectoralis major flap? This is true for tumors involving the hypopharynx and those which extend distally towards the cricopharyngeus, and also those who you will be doing a salvage laryngectomy where you will need an overlay over the pharyngeal repair. Will the patient need a tracheoesophageal speech? Will you do a primary puncture in theater or you do it later 10 days? Or if at all, are you going to offer this patient a, a, a speech valve? And also the presence of or absence of synchronous or metastatic tumors. These will need a panendoscopy and the chest x-ray, as I've mentioned before. And then will the patient need an elective neck dissection or not? So when it comes to the, the need for a neck, a neck dissection or not, I found this paper quite comprehensive and quite detailed. And I'll, I'll, 
I would advise you to, to, to have a look at it. It was written a bit of a time back, but it is still up to date. Uh, it uh, advocates for aggressive surgical approach to the neck. And the reason why is because once we've done a total laryngectomy, we would have managed to control the primary tumor. So it's unlikely to, you're unlikely to have a recurrence where you've done a total laryngectomy. However, the survival depends on the tumors in the neck, how much of a tumor is in the neck, and also distant uh, metastasis. So this paper advocates for an aggressive surgical approach to the clinically and positive and NO and neck. So the argument for this will be uh, detailed in the following. The first is staging the NO neck. Now the problem with preoperative staging here is the sensitivity. Because we know that preoperative staging modalities have about a 75% sensitivity. And the majority of lymph node metastasis in the N0 neck are actually less than 10 millimeters in diameter. I chatted with my radiology colleagues and they agreed that most of the time they look at, tum at uh, size is more than 10 millimeters. That's when they suspect that there is a cancer. But however, we know that in the NO neck, you will have positive lymph nodes that are actually less than 10 millimeters. So that renders a, a, a limitation to imaging. And also you get non-malignant nodes that vary in size from two to 20 millimeters. And we know that extra capsular spread occurs in about 23% of the nodes which are less than 10 millimeters. So as I've said, then the imaging, which is CT, MRI, and ultrasound, give actually limitations in preoperative staging of, uh, of the neck. Ultrasound guided finding aspiration cytology specificity approaches 100%. However, when you've got an NO neck, that sensitivity goes down to about 44 to 73%. In terms of regional control, you get improved regional control if the NO neck is and all neck is treated with elective neck dissection and adjunctive uh, radiotherapy. It's indicated when risk of occult cervical lymph node metastasis is anything more than 15 to 20%. The elective neck dissection will prevent progression to extracapsular spread, to extracapsular spread of the cancer, and it will detect patients with uh, extracapsular spread who may benefit from uh, adjuvant therapy. In terms of a distant metastasis, the elective neck dissection will reduce risk of distant metastasis by minimizing a neck tumor bed and restricting the duration of nodal metastasis, reducing the number of nodes, and reducing the lower level, uh, lower neck level involvement. And it has also been shown to improve disease-specific survival. So the choice of a neck dissection, you have to think whether you're going to do a selective neck dissection or you're going to do a comprehensive neck dissection and whether you're going to do an ipsilateral or you're going to do a bilateral a, a neck dissection. And this depends on the size of the, on the site of the tumor, its extent and intraoperative staging. We know that cancer of the larynx metastasis to levels one and five is rare. And however, if you're doing a, a, a selective neck dissection and then you find evidence of a tumor spread in the, in the nodes, then you have to convert to comprehensive neck dissection. So for ipsilateral selective neck dissection, which levels two to four, these are done for supraglottic. So just to clear some confusion here, this is ipsilateral, but then we know that supraglottic tends to have a bilateral spread. So it will also come up when you do the contralateral. So in other words, supraglottic, you actually have to do bilateral uh, neck dissections. And you can also do it in transglottic tumors and advanced uh, glottic carcinoma. And level six has to include a thyroid lobectomy. And this is routinely dissected for glottic and subglottic carcinoma. So contralateral uh, uh, elective neck dissection is also governed by the tumor site. As I've said, again, the supraglottis is one of the tumors where you have to do the contralateral uh, neck dissection. However, it's not indicated for glottic cancer per se, except if there is involvement of the medial wall of the piriform fossa. So if there is involvement of the medial piriform fossa, we know that these tumors tend to also uh, metastasize to the contralateral neck then you have to do a, a bilateral. So after we've done the total laryngectomy and we've done elective neck dissection, this is the post-operative post care that we institute here. We give antibiotics for 24 hours. We give a, a PPI for 14 days to prevent pharyngocutaneous fistula. We put a chest a physiotherapy. Most of our patients uh, get a, a, an early fitting protocol 
and this is the uh, protocol on, on the right side, we start on day one with the intravenous, with the stomach gastric feeds, and then we increase that by day five, you'll be having a normal diet. And then we remove the suction drains when it's less than 50 mils in the drain, we remove sutures after day seven, and we insert the speaking valve if it hasn't been installed in theater. And then we cover the stomach with a bib. So the evidence of this uh, post-operative care is because of these studies that have been done here in the University of Cape Town. So in terms of uh, post laryngectomy care, you can offer the patients radiotherapy or chemo radiation. So the indications for radiotherapy are if the tumor is spread through the thyroid cartilage into the extralaryngeal soft tissues, if you've got positive margins or closed margins, if you've got intraoperative tumor spillage in pre or preoperative tracheostomy through the tumor, and if you've got subglottic tumor extension, and in the neck, if there's more than one metastasis in this extracapsular spread, you offer them chemo radiation if you've got positive margins and extracapsular spread. So we go back again to that table that I showed on from Scott Brown. It's advocating for first choice chemo radiation therapy for T3 cancers and second choice and total laryngectomy is actually offered as a third choice. However, for, and for T4A, it offers total laryngectomy as the first choice and a chemo radiation therapy as the second choice. So we have to look at literature. What does the literature say? Does the literature agree with this or there is some variation? And for that, we tend to two landmark studies that changed the, the treatment of advanced laryngeal cancer. The first one is the Department of Veteran Study, which was a large prospective randomized study. It involved, multi involved multiple institutes, and it was a landmark study, which was a pub um, published in 1991. It uh, recruited patients with stage three and stage four squamous cell carcinoma of the larynx, 332 patients. Two thirds of them had a supraglottic squamous cell carcinoma, and the majority of these were said to have been T3. Of note is that this was the first study to suggest a non-surgical treatment of advanced uh, cancer of the larynx. So what happened is the patients were put into two groups. There was a surgical arm and a non-surgical arm. So the patients were offered, were randomly put in these two groups. Those who were in the surgical arm were done surgery, total laryngectomy, and after, afterwards they were offered post-op radiation. And then in the other arm, the patients were offered induction chemoradiotherapy three cycles, but initially they were given two cycles. Those who responded went on to have the third cycle and post and radiotherapy. And those who were still not responding to the radiotherapy were then offered salvage surgery. But then those who were given two cycles and did not respond were straight away offered surgery and post-op radiotherapy, as this table from uh, uh, Cummings illustrates. So the results, of this were 64% laryngeal preservation in the induction therapy radiotherapy group, though only 39% of those patients had a fully functional larynx. And after two years, there was a 68% survival in both groups, surgical and non-surgical arm. And crucially, this study found that actually after five years, there was no survival difference between the two groups. The second landmark study was the RTOG 9111 study, also randomized a prospective study published in 2003. Uh, this recruited 518 patients and the aim was to determine the relative contributions of uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy to laryngeal preservation. And it was to determine also if concurrent uh, chemotherapy would improve uh, a laryngeal preservation. And Included were patients with untreated stage three and four glottic and supraglottic squamous cell carcinoma requiring a, a total laryngectomy. Excluded were T1 tumors and bulky T4 tumors with cartilage destruction and cartilage invasion and extensive tongue uh, invasion. So at two years, uh, the larynx was preserved in 88% of those patients who were offered concurrent chemoradio uh, therapy, which was the um, to and it was a res, a preserved in 75% of those who were offered induction chemotherapy followed by a radiotherapy. And it was a preserved in 70% in the radiotherapy only group. And crucially, it found that after five years, there was a similar five year survival rate in all these groups. However, there was a high grade toxicity rate in the patients with chemo radiation therapy, which was 82%. So the conclusions from the RTOG 9111 study was chemoradiation therapy was superior to sequential therapy or radiotherapy alone for local regional control 
for stage three or stage four laryngeal cancer with T2, T3, or low volume. Now, low volume, this was a term that was introduced by the authors of this paper, low volume T4 tumors. And they suggested that laryngectomy should be used only as salvage therapy. Fortunately, we've had a time since these studies were published to look at the data, what has happened when people followed that protocol of, of those studies. So Hoffman analyzed 158,000, uh, almost 158,000 cases between 1995 and 2000. And he found that there was a decline in the five-year relative survival of patients who had advanced cancer of the larynx between 1985 and 1990 and 94 and 1996. Specifically looking at the 1994 to 1996 period, he found that there was a poor five-year relative survival for T3, N0, M0, all the sites, all the anatomical sites of the larynx for patients who had been offered chemo radiation, which was 59%, and irradiation alone, which was 42%. Five-year survival in those categories, chemo radiation and irradiation alone was less than those who had been offered surgery with irradiation, which was 65%, and surgery alone, whose survival rate was 63%. And also between 1990, 1985 and 2007, Chen looked at the treatment protocols that were being used. And he found that the use of chemo radiation therapy had actually increased from less than 7% to 45%. And the use of total laryngectomy had actually decreased from 42% to 32%. And for four-year survival rates, total laryngectomy had actually offered a, a superior a, a survival rate of 51% compared to chemo radiation therapy and radiotherapy. And this was despite the use of a chemo radiation therapy in younger patients from higher socioeconomic groups. They noted that there was a poor tissue healing in patients and there were side effects like pharyngeal and esophageal edema and stenosis. And salvage total laryngectomy in these patients was resulting in more complications like fistulas and patients were to started to be admitted for a longer time and more surgeries uh, were done to try to correct this. And in the long term also, they started seeing uh, complications like atherosclerosis of the carotid vessels, delayed pharyngeal fibrosis and stenosis, inability to swallow, aspiration, multifocal cancers uh, in the treatment area. This I took from the editorial that was done by uh, uh, Kerry Olsen, who reviewed these papers. So in it, he asks what happened? Why should it, because at this time, laryngeal cancer was the only cancer in the human body that had a waste of survival, whose survival was actually going down compared to all the other cancers. So he asked the question, what happened? And then he had a look at these studies. And the first, uh, the first thing he noted was there could have been selection bias in these studies because these were multiple institutions which were done over many years with few patients a year per institute. And they had more supraglottic tumors, which was actually 68% in the RTOG 911 study. But then we know that in practice, actually glottic uh, uh, cancer is more common than supraglottic. And secondly, there was a questionable treatment of, uh, for, for mobile vocal cords. Because if you look at the patients, almost half of these patients had mobile vocal cords almost have 48% in the veteran study and 42% in the RTOG study. So such patients, patients will not have needed a total laryngectomy anyway. And there was an unclear definition of advanced cancer. And the uh, introduction of the RTOG authors of the term low volume a T4 tumor. And the overall stage and T stage were often confused because you can have a patient with a stage three uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the larynx but it's actually a T2, it's got, or even T1, and it's got mobile vocal cords. So that patient is not, by definition, having an advanced cancer of the larynx. Advanced is T3 and T4. So because of that, he suspects that there might have been confusion in stage and T staging of the, of the cancers. Also, the health and age of the patients, more than 80% of the patients who were involved in this study is at a Karnofsky performance score of, uh, of more than 90. But we know that typically patients with the cancer of the larynx are actually older, they are smokers, they drink, and they have poor performance status compared to those patients who are involved in those studies. And, to, and they are unlikely to extend a chemo radiation therapy. And also 73% of the patients in the RTOG study 
at low neck volume disease, which is somewhat surprising because given that supraglottic cancers tend to metastasize more to the neck. So in summary, as we have seen, a cancer of a treatment of a T3 a laryngeal cancer is controversial because these tumors are actually a heterogeneous group. We need an individualized approach. Survival and function should be the primary endpoints uh, for future studies. Uh, when it comes to T4A laryngeal cancer, the treatment is primary surgery and radiotherapy or chemo radiation therapy. Now, in this study, which looked at the median survival for total laryngectomy, after total laryngectomy, uh, survival was six to one month. And for those with undergone laryngeal preservation with chemo radiation therapy, survival was 39 months. So it confirmed the superiority of a, a total laryngectomy over a chemo radiation therapy. T4B tumors, you cannot get a key emergence because there's encasement of the carotid artery and prevertebral fascia. So these are normally irresectable tumors and they're not for surgery. So they tend to be referred to oncology to get a definite, definite or radical chemo radiation therapy aiming for cure or, or palliation with a, with a So because we're in Africa and we don't have all the equipment and, and expertise that we might need, uh, I to go to the African Head and Neck Society website to guide us how we can treat uh, patients with uh, advanced laryngeal cancer or even any other cancer for that matter in the head and neck. And it is tailored to the expertise that we, we might be having. So if you, if you search and then you go to this website, you'll find there where it says the clinical practice guidelines for head and neck cancer. So if you click on that, then this will come up, African Head and Neck Society, clinical practice guidelines for head and neck cancers in developing countries with a, a limited resource settings. So in this case, for example, if I want to look at the supraglottic cancers, I click on supraglottic cancers, and then it takes me to this index page, supraglottic cancers, and then I select the guideline according to available resource scenarios. scenarios. So if I click on that, then it will show me what I have. Then depending on what I have, for example, if you have everything that we talked about, you have got a CT, MRI, carbon dioxide, laser, chemo radiation. If you have all those things that, that we've talked about here, then you click on number one and then this will come up. It will show you exactly what to do. For example, T3, small volume, it will advise you to do a supracrike with laryngectomy. It will advise you to chemo radiation, including next and so forth. And then if at the other extreme, for example, if you click on 16, like you have nothing, it will show you that if you have diagnosed that, uh, that tumor and you've got a T3, T4, you don't have CT, you don't have a laser, you don't have any surgical expertise to do a total laryngectomy or partial laryngectomy, then you can only do a tracheostomy for stridor and offer palliative care. So I've left in between, so it depends on what, depending on what you have. You can click, for example, on five or six or seven or whatever, and then it will guide you exactly uh, what to use. And it is quite useful because it's tailored to us in terms of what we have. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you very much for the great overview. I think uh, you've raised some important uh, discussions that I'm sure that we're, we're gonna delve into right now. Just for ease of uh, reference, I've also posted on the, on the chat function uh, uh, references or links to the African Head and Neck Society uh, uh, guidelines so you can access uh, those guidelines just via the chat function. Um, uh, Rafael, if I may, I just had a clarification on one of your slides that mentioned that supraglottic cancer um, has, um, sorry, um, I'm saying, um, I just have a clarification on one of your slides on supraglottic cancer that mentioned uh, that there's late spread. Um, I just wanted to clarify, did you mean that it sort of, it remains locally confined uh, to their subsite for quite a long time until quite relatively late. Um, and then, uh, but despite that, it still has propensity for nodal spread quite early, but, and bilaterally. So sort of is, is that the direction you, you meant? Yes, that's what I meant. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I, I see it's uh, Professor Johan Fagan is, is also online. Professor Fagan, uh, any comments uh, or any uh, discussion you'd like to raise from your side? Well, firstly to say, I thought that was an excellent review. Um, it, it, it is a complex topic and it's something which, which has caused 
caused me lots of agony over the years about whether we're taking out larynxes without good reason. Yeah. Essentially, I mean, I think whenever you face with a laryngeal cancer, you want to do your best to try and preserve that larynx. But it has to be a functional mm. larynx. And, um, and, and really, if, you, if you're starting out, out with a dysfunctional larynx in terms of swallowing or airway or voice, then you're unlikely to restore function. And so I think, as, uh, you know, as um, uh, Rafael uh, quite, quite clearly said, uh, you know, there's no point in, in treating, treating a, a dysfunctional larynx uh, with primary chemo radiation because, uh, because you're unlikely to, to improve that, that quality of, um, of, of the organ. Um, and, you know, and I think the, the last few few studies, which he quoted in terms of you know, of of the, of the decline in terms of survival um, in the U.S., so using the Sears um, data um, of laryngeal cancer, and it being the only cancer in the body that we've seen a decline. And I think the only way we can explain that is the introduction introduction of chemo radiation therapy. Um, so, uh, so I think one has to be selective in terms of the patient that you're going to treat. They have to be fit. They have to be, uh, be young enough to be able to tolerate it. Um, and, and they have to have, have small volume tumors, ideally. Uh, they shouldn't have cartilage invasion and they should have a functional larynx. And you should also, in your institution, be able to offer them salvage surgery. Because remember that the, that the survival figures for chemo radiation would also include those undergoing salvage surgery. So if you can't offer them, them salvage surgery and you can't monitor them closely too, because if you're giving primary chemo radiation, then you have to monitor them. And so all those factors come into play. So you have to really look at your local, local situation and, um, and, uh, you know, and you might say that in your local situation, you can't offer them good, good salvage treatment and you might, might go more for, more for primary um, surgery. Uh, but, but, but otherwise, I thought it was an excellent presentation. Uh, Professor Fagan, I had a, I had a, a question for you as well. Uh, just uh, on the study that, uh, that Rafael posted on the, the group uh, that Professor Eugene Myers and, and yourself uh, wrote on the management of the neck in 1999. Uh, my question really was that in the last 20 years since that study was, was published, uh, any comments on how the standard of practice has changed or rather remained the same? Well, that study really focused on the management of the neck um, um, in laryngeal cancer. And, uh, and so nothing much has changed really from that perspective. Um, I guess imaging has improved. Uh, um, so you can, can follow patients more, more carefully and you can stage them more carefully. Uh, that's, uh, that's one thing that has changed. Um, yeah, but otherwise there isn't much, much, much which has changed, which is kind of disappointing because you would have thought that, uh, that over a, a 20 year period, period, we should have seen more, uh, some more progress from that perspective. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Fagan. Um, any other comments or questions? I, I invite uh, our participants or audience to please either raise their hand or use the function there, or you can either type in your question, please. This is the time that we can discuss any, any burning issues that you might have. Um, uh, Rafael, in, any other comments from your side? Uh, no, no comments just here. Thank you. I see if, you, if there are no more further comments or questions, um, uh, Rafael, I think uh, we'll, we'll probably wrap it here. Thank you very, very much for your, for your great overview. Um, and I think we will wrap it here. Thank you very much for everyone that's uh, been able to join us uh, in the last hour. Um, I'd like to further invite you for this Friday session. This Friday, we have Autology Day, uh, where we'll have three case discussions that will be centered around autology. So a warm welcome to you, um, and, uh, and we look forward to your participation this Friday. Uh, I'd like to also mention that uh, we, we're trying to just alter our timings slightly. So next Wednesday, our, our discussions might actually be in the morning, uh, similar to our Friday timing. So we may begin 8.30 in the morning next week, Wednesday. So I will communicate to everyone uh, via email or WhatsApp. Uh, thank you very much, and um, have a lovely day ahead. Thank you.